Welcome to Innovating Music, a podcast of the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music. I am your host, Dr. Gigi Johnson. Please welcome back on this podcast, Jay Gilbert. He is co-head of Label Logic. He is your guide to your morning coffee every Friday as a wonderful newsletter that comes out about music industry trends and change. And he is the longtime co-host of Music Biz Weekly podcast. Jay is a returning guest to the podcast, and we recorded this episode in April of 2020. We are releasing it in June of 2020, and a lot of the questions about the impact of the pandemic on music marketing, releases, live music, are largely still questions today. So please enjoy this podcast and our recurring conversations with the wonderful Jay Gilbert. Jay, it is so great to have you back on the podcast. We have not had that many returning guests in our four years of this adventure. Thank you. And I'm very honored to have you because you've been such a great Aww. friend of Innovating Music. You've been a good friend of the UCLA program. But you also have such a, a unique lens on change and innovation in music because you are working in several spaces at the same time. You're in photography. You're in uh, label services, you're working with individual bands. How, how, how's your life right now? We're talking in, in April of 2020. Yeah. I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic. So a lot of folks are working from home and a lot of releases are being delayed and a lot of artists are not touring, um, which you know, a lot of release cycles are set up around tours. So there's been a little bit of madness, but my life really isn't that different. I'm, I'm crazy busy. You know, I have like three companies, which isn't a lot for you, but for me, it's a lot. <laughs> and it keeps me... I only have three companies. That's all I've got. Every or three, time I talk three to you, employers, I, I feel like you've got all. like... You know, oh, did I tell you about this company I started? And I did, I'm this initiative, and and I love that because you're you're a force of nature. But with you know, with what I do, it really has um, stopped the photography and videography stuff, which is kind of my weekend passion. I, and I do it with a lot of our artists, where we do exploratory photo shoots, or we'll shoot you know some you know lower. Um, dollar value videos, you know, for socials and for websites and things like that. And because of the pandemic, that has been uh, stopped. But as far as label and artist services, this is an always on music business. And I tell clients that all the time. You don't, it's not the 18 to 24 month release cycle that it may have been 10 years ago. Um, you have to keep uh, your audience engaged and keep that relationship going with your audience. And, you know, it's, it's a wild, wild west in the sense that if you want to release uh, a few tracks, you can. If you want to release an EP, you don't have to release a, a full length album. In fact, I discourage uh, folks from from doing that, especially developing artists until they have demand for it. Right. So my my business, other than having, you know, a couple of college students uh, at home, uh, taking away my valuable bandwidth um, and having my uh, my wife who's a teacher at home. And you know how that is. You know, we're all kind of at home um, making the best of the situation. But my job is busier than ever. Um, I have more clients than ever. And um, the, the pandemic and working from home really haven't affected that too much. And I think we're both lucky, though, that we already were working from home. And, and I do think that I'm dealing with a lot of students and artists who essentially are now home with an old laptop, shared bandwidth, no microphones. Uh, though, interestingly, evidently, equipment sales are up, as you as you kind of would expect, that people who were thinking about this had Sweetwater or somebody drop ship stuff to their house and so whether it's instruments or uh, DAWs, uh, digital uh, audio workstations, that sales of those, and I don't know the exact number, this is a Rolling Stone article recently, that people are creating these home environments where they can be doing things. So I know that <laughs> I went and, and made sure that we had the equivalent of updated earthquake supplies. I'm here in California early on in this current adventure. And then I started having new headset delivered. <laughs> 
and and two more mics. So that's I'm in that same headspace where I was having stuff come to my office. Yeah, I think a lot of people are not just that, um, but you know. People are ordering, you know, uh, lighting for these, uh, you know, video conferences and like you said, better microphones. But because of the the gain in live streaming, just the, the surge of people live streaming um, music, for example, it's just been phenomenal. And I think um, a lot of folks are grabbing the equipment they need. Uh, for that or upgrading the equipment they have. Um, but we're all, you know, kind of learning as we go. I was joking with someone yesterday, I think that it's like the ultimate house concert, that the house concert business has been around for a really long time and somewhere under the radar. So PROs aren't necessarily noticing as much or having deals with PROs so that if it's not advertised, that you don't have to do anything about it. And actually don't know what the heck the PROs are doing with all this live streaming. That's actually an interesting question. Yeah, Billboard just put out a, a really interesting um, article. Um, I didn't put it in your morning coffee, which we'll talk about later, um, because it was behind the paywall, but they just took it out from behind the paywall. Um, basically about all of these um, different issues that arrive, as you just mentioned, you know, with, with live streaming, things that people never or rarely considered before, like, do you have the rights to, you know, do a performance of this um, over the airwaves? And you, and previously that's been a problem you had for a lot of festivals. YouTube had snapped up a lot of the live streaming rights back when they were just starting to do live streaming and people didn't know how to value that. But then that's different than recording. So it really is an interesting question about, you know, do you have the right to live stream and or record the live stream? And I know on Twitch, that's one of the things we've actually, um, that Karen Allen was on here talking about some of that stuff that, you know, you, you get sometimes bounced or penalized if it's the recording side, but live streams have been a, di a bit of a different species for a while. So that's right. Well, you know, Facebook and YouTube early on, as you mentioned, um, they, they had got blanket rights. They have rights so they can do this because it's such a big part of their, uh, their business. But I've been doing living room concerts, house concerts for a little over 20 years. And, you know, I've had people like Kurt Smith from Tears for Fears and Lisa Loeb and, you know, we've, uh, the Accidentals. We've had some really amazing, in fact, you came to that show. I came to the Accidental show. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, mm -hmm. shameless plug. But, you know, that's something that, you know, because of the fact that it was really a group of friends more than anything and it wasn't uh, advertised, you know, we didn't cross uh, a lot of those boundaries that a, a lot of artists are going to have to focus on today where it's, it's up everywhere. People can see it. It's advertised. It's promoted. And in many cases, it's monetized. Mm -hmm. And I know for house concerts uh, that, and I try and remember if it was uh, the folks who are helping out from Concerts in Your Home, which is another, I think, I think still another uh, site that aggregates house concerts. Or uh, whether it was Folk Alliance was really sitting down with the PROs and saying, at what point in time, will, you know, can we put a bright line that this is this is something that doesn't need annual PRO payments? And because here's all the edges of it. And so this now walks into it. Let me back up, though. So you're busy doing what? That's a good question. Well, what, what I do, you know, with label and artist services is uh, my partner, Jeff and I run a company called label logic and we are basically the label infrastructure, uh, for management companies, artist management companies, and a few artists. Um, and we actually run the label for a few clients, uh, including uh, resilience music Alliance. And, uh, we won our first Grammy this year. So it was a, it was a great, a great year. Um, but what that entails is everything that you would expect a label to do, even things kind of behind the scenes, like maybe getting a Harry Fox license or an ISRC code or helping with the creative. And But the, the basic uh, job is planning. You want to have uh, a marketing plan. You want to get everything flying in formation, you know. So many artists will come to us and say, yeah, well, I, I dropped this in the marketplace and it didn't really perform. 
And when you dig in a little deeper, you find that there was no planning involved. It was just basically dropped into the marketplace. And it's hard to rise above the clutter uh, today. So if you have a marketing plan, whether you're doing, you know, online advertising, whether you're doing things with, you know, ECRM, which is a fancy way of saying your, your email correspondence and, you know, socials and sync licensing. And there, there, there there's so many different areas that you need to kind of dig into to set up a plan. And, and what's fun about the music industry, and you know this, is that no two plans are the same. There, because everybody has different goals. For example, the first two questions I ask a client are, you know, what's the narrative? You know, why should anybody care? What What is the story behind this song or this album or this EP, whatever it is? Why should anybody be interested in this? Um, because that's key. And you need to have, it has to be genuine, but it has to be compelling. And it's something that everybody will be on the same page with, right? The pu- publicist will want that narrative. When you enter something into Spotify's um, submission tool, you need a narrative. That That's where that goes. So that's really, really compelling. And then the second part is, you know, what's your vision? You know, meaning, you know, what are your goals? And everybody has different goals. You know, we were talking about some of the jazz artists that we work with, and some of their goals are, they center around touring and accolades. That's what they want. They want to, you know, they want to have a serious tour schedule. You do? Some people, that's not even on their list. You know, like their list is revenue or butts in the seats or they, you know, they want to grow their base or they want, you know, to be, you know, they want to collaborate with uh, their peers. There's everybody, I've never had two clients say the same thing when it comes to narrative or vision it's always different no i would suggest i would suggest that in some cases the the question of the vision matures as you work with them that that really sort of yeah because it's it's what you start out thinking you want and then you look under the hood at what's possible what other artists are doing how tech is changing but in case, this case, it, for a lot of folks, it's the crap, my tour just disappeared. My whole year's disappeared. Right. What is my vision in this environment? That's a good point. It, it does evolve and it does change. And it also, and I think you were alluding to this, it, it's also the maturity of the artist in the sense that you get a baby band or a developing artist and they're going to have a different set of goals um, from their first album to their second. And I, I always remember this article. Uh, I read this interview with um, Elvis Costello and he said that it took him 10 uh, years to write his first album, uh, My Aim is True. And it took him 10 weeks to write his second album because, you know, before you launch, you're learning, growing, writing, recording, touring, you're doing all this stuff. And then kind of, if you get to that point where you're successful, now things are expected more frequently and the release cadence quickens and that will change your vision as well, I think. And also that, you know, we have, um, I tend to joke life is like a series of Venn diagrams that you've got these interesting overlaps that it might be that this is the perfect time to be then connecting with someone you've not had time with before, or that this might be the right time to then connect your favorite charity to your work or to regroup. And so it might be that you now realize you're not spending enough time with your spouse or possibly too much time with your spouse. And you're having to sort of really rethink what your objectives are or where you live. Or uh, I know that uh, separate from music, my own sister was sick a few years ago and realized that they were living in the sticks, lovely sticks, but in the sticks in Europe. And no one came to see them and they were afraid, well, what if one of us gets sick? And luckily now, you know, as all this is happening, that they move to a place where there is support structure and support to them. And, you know, they're not young people anymore. You know, can you still be, you know, how does your life circumstance change how you look at your music? And how does the new technology now change what is possible? So did I, do I now need to tour? Could I build a whole hybrid structure? Where can I have new, I can have new intimate experiences with fans that could be a great supplement to a touring structure. 
Yeah, those are those are all good questions. I had a client tell me last week that they are making more revenue now during this pandemic with their live streaming than they did when they were touring. Now, that's not going to be the case for all artists, but that's interesting. And they were saying, why didn't we think of this before? But I think we didn't need to think of it before. Um, live streaming was um, was a substitute and not a very good one. Well, or people are still using some of the same tools. So Stage It's been here now for a while going, hey, come to... <laughs> but part of the question though, I mean, a lot, there's so many unknowns. When, when we can go back out, We'll be going out to do what, with what density of space, and what type of space, and and my favorite comment that keeps coming up, with what insurance. So uh, the cost structure to do a show and the density of delivery may be really different. Am I looking at, you know, I'm going to, you know, people may not be home waiting to see live stream shows. They might, there might be a whole blended experience where I'm going to want to have a live stream option in a live show so I could have supplemental income because I, I won't have the density and the same food and beverage outcomes and the same merch outcomes if I've got fewer people in the space, my ARPU, my average revenue per user is going to be potentially screwed. So is it we're really now needing to live in an unknown, but live in an unknown where there might be a whole blended delivery that could be the new, the different, another new normal. Yeah. I think there's two things here to unpack. One is the misconception that when this is over, it's going to be on a Tuesday and then everything's just going to magically be, okay, it's all back to normal. Let's, let's go to that uh, festival. And I think we both know that this is going to be a gradual thing over time and eventually you know, we'll get back to that place. But I think we're forever changed for a couple of reasons. One is we've learned how to do these things like live streaming and to be productive at home and to build our brand and, and relationships with our fans um, without going out on the road. So I think it's put another tool in our toolbox that we didn't really have. A lot of us didn't know how to use Stage It. Yes, they've been around for 15 years and, you know, they've had a lot of artists use it. But up until recently, it wasn't on a lot of people's radar. Well, now it is. And there are, you know, dozens of other solutions for live streaming where you get paid or you do it for free or you have a tip jar or whatever that is. And the point is, is that now you've got that new tool that you didn't have before. So maybe instead of going out on the road eight months out of the year, maybe it'll be six months and then you'll, you know, you'll have some live streaming events kind of sprinkled in. It's, I don't know exactly how it's going to look for each artist. They're going to have their own uh, different flavors, but that's the exciting part for me is looking forward to watching how people take these skills and these tools and these, this new equipment they bought you know, <laughs> during the pandemic. And what are they going to do with it as the pandemic lessens and eventually goes away? I think that's going to be exciting. And I also think some of the opportunity, I tend to lament a lot working with smaller artists and with my students working at UCLA with smaller artists, that you oftentimes are at the mercy of the platform for the data and I'm finding in quite a few of the live streaming environments, one of the payoffs is you can see what fans showed up. And so how live streaming could be then one of those super fan diagnostic tools. And so that if you can combine that with geographic data, you actually now have fan data that you may not have had before and might have a whole new kind of pre-marketing tool or even post-marketing tool so that... You know, we just came and did an event in your town and now you can sign up for a live stream follow up. And then it's another um, check mark as to, OK, Joe Smith came to that. Excellent. Joe Smith's now come to three things. Joe Smith has, you know, responds quickly. We can then send Joe Smith other things. Uh, I, I tend to think I used to I used to teach marketing for media at the business school at UCLA. And I used to always give the example of the Franklin Mint. 
that Franklin Mint would try to sell you a doll or a belt buckle or whatever with three easy payment plans. And if you made that first payment, they that told them that you, first of all, made a payment, second of all, that you like either the doll topic or dolls, so that they would send you something else to find out whether it was dolls or the doll topic, and now they had a database. And, and that's been a challenge for a lot of artists because they can't see through Spotify to see, they can see aggregate, but not individual. And so I think this is another non-aggregated data point that you could actually build engagement metrics around that lets you feed things that might be then richer opportunities for building VIP. 100%. Because the relationship right now, you had mentioned, you know, uh, digital service providers. So like uh, Spotify and Apple Music, they have that unique identifier. They know who uh, the audience down to the individual user is you don't. Um, yes, you can get some really great uh, data um, from both of those platforms and many others. You know, Spotify for artists, Apple Music for artists. You know, that's that's really great, but you don't have that direct relationship um, that you have. And to your point, with with data, when you start doing some of these uh, live streaming or some of these events online, you can break down that wall and now you have um, that relationship. And that that is strong. And that's why I always tell clients that don't give up on email. Oh my um, gosh, yeah. It still works. It's still powerful and it's not sexy. Um, and a lot of folks have let their lists go because, uh, you know, maybe they weren't, as active as they should have been on the last tour and maybe some of the data is older. But I always tell them, look, reach out to these folks, refresh that list that you've got a direct line with consumers, engage with them. And there's also you know, the, the the techie things like drip marketing, right? So I have a class right now doing advanced internet marketing at UCLA. And so one of the things they're doing is going to artists that they consider competitors for their brands and signing up for their email lists. And it is shocking how many of them don't give a welcome to the email list response. And there's no drip marketing set up for all this stuff. And, and all of that feeds the beast, right? All of that tells you who's interested, who's active, gives you information, has ways that you can remind people. But so many folks have let that thing go stagnant on their sites. Yeah, and it's so important. For example, YouTube has a nice functionality. You know, so you have your official artist channel. You can set that intro video so it's different for a first-time visitor than it is for uh, someone who's returning. And that's that's important because I do the same thing that you just mentioned. I sign up for, you know, emails from other distribution companies, labels, artists, and I see what they do that's compelling and what they do that's not. And when I get that welcome email, it, you know, that it's a personal message. I remember it. It's, it's powerful. And you're absolutely right. You know, um, very few people do it. And, and yet, well, I'll, I'll go, I can, I can uh, wax philosophical on email and uh, still the cows come home and it's not that exciting a topic. Uh, on the kind of innovation side, what other things are you seeing happening right now? And what would you warn people away from right now? There's, there's so many, gosh, so many great things going on. Um, I think, first of all, the, I would preface it by saying that we're in a unique situation right now uh, during this pandemic in that we as a community, a music community, we're finding ourselves um, at home. What are we going to do with that time? And I had um, Ty Taylor. He's the uh, lead singer for a band called Vintage Trouble. And if you've never seen Vintage Trouble, please go listen, go view them. They're one of the most dynamic bands you'll ever see. Um, they've opened for the Rolling Stones and the Who and the Dixie Chicks and ACDC. And they're, think of them like, uh, you know, if James Brown had the stray cats behind him, you know? Anyway, the reason I bring it up is Ty Taylor was on um, our podcast last week and I was asking him like, how do you, how do you stay healthy during the pandemic? How do you, you know, create, what are you doing during this pandemic? And it was, it was mind blowing to me how 
creative he was and what he was doing and learning new things. And, you know, like we had, we had touched on people buying new equipment. Well, if you're getting new equipment, learn how to use that equipment. You know, you've got that time right now. Uh, if you're a creator, create, you know, writers, write, singers, sing, you know, you have that opportunity right now. And there's a lot of tools out there uh, to kind of help you do that. I'm a big data freak. So I tend to like to look at the data, but to see if there's anything we can pull from it. You know, um, we often talk about audience and a lot of artists that I talk to they, they're right about their audience to a certain point. I'd say they're about 75% correct about their audience because, you know, they see the audience at a live show and they may think that's our audience. Or they look on socials and they think, oh, well, that's, that's my audience, the insights I see on socials. But they might not be looking at ECRM, you know. They might not be looking at uh, official quote unquote data, you know, from Nielsen or, or Buzz Angle or something like that, which actually talks about consumption, sales, streams, downloads. So, and then the last part of that is these, the generic term smart URL, it isn't fair because, you know, that's a brand came up with a <laughs> smart URL. Yeah. yeah, it is. It's a brand, but it's like Kleenex, you know, everybody just calls, you know, feature FM, link fire, whatever. But the point is there's so much data that you can get, um, from that as well as all of these other things. Um, and, you know, we talked about ECRM. Um, you talk about tools that are exciting. You know, there's so many great platforms out there, you know, whether it's, you know, MailChimp or Constant Contact, and there's, there's a lot of different platforms um, to use, but there's so much uh, data you can get and so many ways you can engage with your audience which I think is exciting. A lot of the tools that I'm using aren't necessarily brand new tools. It's kind of like we talked about Stage It. You know, it's been around for 15 years, but, you know, it's new to a lot of people, right? So I, I use, you know, companies like Found E um, for folks who have never visited. It's, it's the word found.ee. And they help with, you know, basic audience growth and advertising. Um, Tone Den is another one that I like a lot that, that uh, you know, you can do, um, you know, it's for audience growth, but you can do advertising, messaging. Um, you and I have talked about one of my favorite little tools, um, Bot Letter, which is pretty cool in that if you want to communicate with your Facebook audience, yeah, you can boost a post and you can do advertising and things like that, but you never reach 100% of your audience. And what, what um, platforms like BotLetter can help you do is to get a message to every one of your followers that says, hey, um, would you like to receive a monthly um, communication from me? If so, you know, click here. And once you've got that group, which is, I find is typically half of, of the, the audience that will engage with you, then you've got some real people that you can communicate with and build a relationship with. And now you've broken down that barrier, that wall that maybe you had um, with, uh, with Spotify. But I think those tools, I'm, I'm a really big fan of uh, Bandzoogle, which it, they've been around a long time too. I think they've been around like 15 years, but what Bandzoogle helps you build a website. Well, so does Wix and Squarespace and tons of other platforms. But the difference between Bandzoogle is they are, it was built by musicians for musicians. So if you're in the entertainment space, it's simple for you to sell your music, stream your music, download music. They've got um, these modules where you can set up your own Patreon type um, page. You can set up your own, almost like a pledge music type thing where, where people can <laughs> buy experience Without the characteristics of pledge music. <laughs> without the bankruptcy yeah. here. Uh, it's an administration, which is what the UK calls bankruptcy. But anyway, so I, I've been playing with Banzoogle and I built a few sites for folks. You know, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of Patreon. Um, I think there's some artists out there that are doing a really good job with Patreon. And if you haven't played with them, it's basically you subscribe 
to the artist, for example. And then each month, maybe you get a free live stream concert or a free download, or um, you can watch them talk about which books they like. And it's, it's really cool and it's a deeper experience. Um, and then, you know, the, the last one I'll probably mention, and, and again, we could talk all day about these tools because it's so much fun to try these things out. Um, but one that a people, a lot of people, um, miss is bands in town because yeah. everybody knows bands in town. You know, it's that app that looks at what is in your music library and says, Oh, Gigi, you like, uh, you know, the accidentals. Well, guess what? They're coming to town in a few weeks and Oh, cool. I can buy tickets. That's cool. And it's a free thing and it's fun. But when, when you go into bands in town manager, you can look at, well, you don't even have to go into manager. You can just go into bands in town to, to see the number, but you can see how many people are tracking you. And a lot of our artists, it's in the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people are tracking them. Well, through Bands in Town Manager, you can communicate with them for free. You can send them a message. Hey, guess what? I've got a new record coming out in a couple of weeks. I think you might like it. But what I find compelling about Bands in Town, and it's something that we've used on most of our releases, is to reach out to like competitive audiences, like you were talking about with your students. You know that um, aspirationally, there's an artist you love, you know, you would tour well with because your sounds, you know, would complement each other or, you know, whatever that is. Well, with Bands in Town Manager, you can go in there and say, here are five other artists. I want to communicate with their fan base and tell them, hey, you like uh, this art? You like Vintage Trouble? I think you'll like my band. And you, for five cents an email, you can send them uh, a message and typical, you and I talk about this all the time, you know, typical open rates in the music industry around 16, 17% with those types of emails. I typically see double that. Um, and I rarely see anything less than that. So yeah, that's, that's been a fun tool to play with and one that's so easy to use, but people often overlook it. And we just had uh, their CEO on the show. I don't know if there's going to be come in before or after this one, but they're doing a tremendous amount with live streaming now. Awesome. Yeah. But aren't they kind of becoming the, the place where they used to be for live shows? They're doing the same thing with live streaming, right? Where they're, it's a destination where you can, it's the TV guide for live streaming. Absolutely. Though for some people they'll go, what's a TV guide? That's a whole nother conversation. Uh, yeah, but a, a, a digital, a digital dashboard for it. But there's other companies who have tried to jump into the space. So I definitely know because they ping me on it. There's many other people out there that are, have launched different guides to find live streams. So that's, uh, and, and, and right now, I think the number is something like 77% of what's happening in bands in town is U.S. Uh, there's other ones that are very European focused. There's other dashboards out there that are trying to be that hub. And there's some really amazing things happening. And the question does get to be the, you know, what is the kind of portfolio of information and relationships? And, and is it that we now as fans... We'll have whole new dashboards of how to see things that may not be Spotify. It might not be Spotify then pushing me to buy a ticket. And you know, I'm, you know, we're again in, in uh, April of 2020. I'm waiting to see, to me, the big unknown is what happens with you know, having some of these subscription-based media businesses that if I'm having income challenges, if I can be getting, let's say, oh, I don't know, YouTube for free, do I really need to be paying for, you know, five different content subscriptions. And then what happens with the extreme dependence that the music business has had, not just on live music, fabulous live music, but also paid streaming models. So I think that um, we're, we're going to see um, earnings releases and forecasts coming out from uh, made of major automotive streamers and major subscription companies that that might be a... a a bite missing of the pie that will make us really relook at what is revenues for artists going forward. Yeah, there's definitely an, an evolution there. And, and I think you're absolutely right. I, I'm excited to kind of see what that is. My, my gut tells me that, you know, Spotify has been very innovative, um, more so than most digital service providers. And they've been very aggressive with things like um, video and podcasts and, 
I'm, I'm anxious to see what, what will happen there, but I'm equally as curious to see how Amazon, um, as a company and as the behavior of their uh, customers um, is going to change. I mean, we've already seen it with these smart speakers, and I, and I can't say it because they're all sitting here on my desk. <laughs> I tend to call to her Madam A when I'm in. talking about her when she's around. Okay, that's good. Madam that's A. Good. So Madam A, you know, we're looking at data coming in, you know, showing, you know, some of the things are pretty obvious. You know, of course, things like uh, children's music is, is going to be more... Um, uh, more streamed through the device and and even classical and there's some things that are going down but I think that behavior and then also Amazon hasn't got a lot of credit for it but they've actually been very innovative in in the background and not everything works not everything sticks but they're like Google in that regard they continuously try to create products that are innovative and that's very difficult to do and so they're launching new things remember they they had a uh, you know the phone for a while there and they had uh you know they had some other programs where you could you know if you bought one of their cds your music digitally was put into a cloud locker and i i tend to think that they're watching what's going on and creating things for it um, that can be compelling. Though I think they're a little bit busy right now. I think the worst advice I got was from one of, from a stockbroker who saw that I still owned a very large amount of Amazon that I'd had since it was small and told me I needed to diversify my, port, diversify my portfolio about a year ago. I have some choice words for him. I did take his advice. Amazon had gone down and now it's like, really? Okay. But we'll see where we end up as this all progresses. The other thing I think we'll see a lot is that, you know, I I tend to talk to the 20 somethings in my classes who think that who think that everyone must go to live concerts. And I I have older data, so I don't know the current data on this, but the average person in the United States, average, only went to two to three ticketed concerts a year. So you know, I know that my younger students, my 20 something students are just so eager to go back out to live music, but I'm not sure they realize that a large portion of the United States doesn't go to live music. So, you know, if you actually can move the dial from two to three average up or down, that's a gigantic change in the business. And I think that that remapping of our behavior with live music is either the upside or the strange side. You know, is it that my, uh, my family, my older adults in my family are going to find live stream music that they never for things they never would have gone to before. Or is it that you've got a dislocation for younger folks who will go to spectaculars? They'll go with the appropriate distancing masking or Lord knows wrap them in saran wrap uh, to go out to a live concert. But it's going to take a spectacular to get you out. And uh, I mean, that's what but film and TV are finding and their battle with homes with, with streamed video is that, you know, you're now needing to have Marvel movies and things that are really spectacular to get you out of the house. I, I think this is going to be interesting to see whenever there's been a shift in media and history, there tends to be a move toward the spectacular for the established old businesses. And I don't know if that's going to be part of this. I agree. And I think that with concerts it's such a different experience to go to a concert than a live stream no matter how great the live stream is and, and i've seen some really great ones um it's it's not the same experience when you're in that hall and the lights go down and you can feel the electricity and your heart starts to pump you know those types of moments you know are are really impactful but it kind of goes back to what we were saying before. I think that it's just going to be part of this new arsenal that these artists have. So yeah, there will be live concerts and festivals, um, but there will also be a lot of these live streams. And I, I'm, I'd love to see the data on what happens after the pandemic with these live streaming platforms, you know, like a stage it, like, um, you know, you can do it on, you know, socials or YouTube. And I, I would love to kind of see what that behavior is because I know with mine, it's it's going to increase. 
um, just because I found that I really enjoy it. And I live in Los Angeles. Man, to get me to drive all the way in and fight traffic, to get, it's got to be a good show. It's got to be something I really want to see. Now, you know, uh, my younger friends and my kids, you know, they'll, they'll go uh, to a lot of shows. They, you know, whatever's going on, that's where they want to be. That's where their friends are. It's, it's a different thing. And I was like that when I was younger, too. I'm a lot more selective now. But I'm, I'm really curious to see if more of these live streams will, A, bring anybody else into the live setting uh, from live streaming or, you know, will it become uh, a part of people's tours as they go forward? Like, like house concerts can be or doing, I mean, some people will do backyard barbecues you know, with fans wrapped around their tour. Is this a new pre-tour house concert? right? An intimacy that's another delivery model that even could be a premium model going forward. Yeah, I saw a band that was, I'm sorry, th this, this band was live streaming their rehearsal for a tour because they had already got it set up. And it reminded me a few years back, I was invited to a dress rehearsal for the Eagles. And they, for their dress rehearsal, they invited um, the frontline kind of emergency workers, you know, people from hospitals and, and law enforcement. It was really cool. Um, and then as, as kind of a joke, they all came out wearing tuxes because it was a dress rehearsal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, what I thought was really cool about that was, first of all, it was a laid back kind of vibe. So if they had to start a song over again, you know, no harm, no foul, right? Um, but... I could see that happening going forward where you get even closer with these artists that you like, because some of the things that we used to take for granted are, may go away, like these paid meet and greets mm -hmm. that have been so popular. And some artists, it's more than just getting your picture taken. It's they'll play an acoustic set for you backstage or, you know, you get things signed, you get to talk to the, the artists and, I think, you know, coming out of this um, pandemic, that's going to have to, you know, be changed dramatically, whether you're behind plexiglass or, or, you know, maybe they go away for some artists. But while that goes away, maybe there's some dress rehearsals or some live streaming or some AMAs, you know, the ask me anything kind of things where you get to um, interact with your favorite artists just in a different way. Well, we're near the end of our adventures. Anything else you want to mention before we head to a close here? Why does that always happen? You know, you and I will meet and we'll talk about, <laughs> you know, we'll solve all the industry's problems no, over a we cappuccino. No, we just ask a lot of questions. So fast. And, we really haven't, it is? and we really haven't talked about your photography either because you're doing some great work in that regard. And I want to thank you for doing pictures for me. Thank you very much. I had not had a, a, a decent new headshot in about 10 years. So that was great. Um, so I, I appreciate that you have such a, a depth of that. We'll have to regroup on that and talk just about the Anytime. role of photography in all of this. And actually, there's several other photographers I now want to introduce you to who are doing some really interesting things right now in terms of music, oh, photography, cool. and documentary out in the world. Very cool stuff. So um, thank you for... You know, just a side note really quickly. Sorry. Um, Chris, who you met, mm -hmm. my photography partner, his wife has been starting to do these porch portraits during the uh, pandemic where your family just gets out on the porch and, you know, they, she dresses everybody up and all of that stuff. I mean, she doesn't, but, but she shoots from a distance. How cool is that? Oh, wow. There was a, a CBS Sunday morning this past weekend that was a photographer just doing that. And I want to say Memphis. And it, it had this sense of, of longing and home and it was just really moving. So I appreciate that whole concept set. If someone wants to reach out to you, how shall they reach out to you? Uh, please reach out to, um, reach out to me via the website, which is label-logic.net. And on that, uh, website is my, uh, my email and text. Um, and you can sign up for your morning coffee, you know, which is my, my weekly um, industry trade email. It's free. It's kind of a curated look at what's going on in the industry each week. 
So, uh, and if people would up. like to also sponsor it, it is sponsorable. So, if you want to have visibility during this time, it's got a pretty sizable fan base. Nudge, 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 nudge. Okay, thank you for joining us, and um, <laughs> and more adventures and digital coffee to follow. 